<clears throat> I'm and we got that. Um, I'm Ralph Brandt. I'm the chair of Empire Multi District Pets. I'm a past district governor from 7120. And I would really like to thank Denise Donato for hosting this evening. Um, one of the things, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And we're, we're going to save questions till our presentations are over. Uh, but then we will get to as many as, as time permits. So please just put them into the chat. Denise will be monitoring those as we go forward. Um, and to lead us off tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Evan Kurtz from past district governor from 7170. He um, is a, actually a, was a char is a charter member of the Dryden Club. He's been an assistant governor and he's a facilitator for RLI. And he's going to lead us through a, a, a few important facts that you will want to know. With that, I turn it over to Evan. Thanks, Ralph. Um, and this is not like an extensive Q&A. This is just showing you stuff that you're going to hear more about later, that every president elect, every president should be cognizant of. Uh, first off is that Rotary Clubs are required by the IRS to file taxes. Your club should be doing that, should have been doing that. If not, um, you can discuss that with some other folks later. All you have to do is file a simple form 990N. If you're under $50,000 a year of cash flow through your club, if you're over $50,000, it's slightly a longer form. Um, filing date is November 15th. So you'll have started your year July 1. One of the first few things financially is you're gonna to have to make sure you file your uh, 990 ends and make sure your club status is up to date. The other couple minor things I'm gonna to touch on is the fact that you're going to get Rotary International dues twice a year. The uh, first one you'll get in early July is a, oops, let me hit the July one, is uh, an invoice, and it's based on the number of members in your club as of June 30. So that's an excellent reason to make sure your club's database is up to date because you will be billed for every Rotarian listed and your first invoice will have multiple items and it's broken out for you. And it's, you know, nothing mysterious there, but you should be aware it's coming. Um, the other invoice will come in uh, January and that will be based on the number of members you have December 31. And this will be less. There's only two items on that one is the number of members and, and your Rotary uh, magazine um, subscriptions. Uh, you'll notice that under quantity, our little Dryden Club has 18 members and only 17 subscriptions. If you're a husband and wife, you can get one of those electronic. That way you're not getting extra paper, excess paper. So those dues will come twice a year. And the third thing you need to be aware of, and your treasurer will help you walk through all this, and other people in your club should know about this, but we want to make sure that president-elects are aware of these upcoming things, is your district dues. And again, those are based on the numbers, uh, June 30 and December 31. And I don't know what 7120's district dues are, but CNY Rotary will be $35 a member. And this should all be fairly routine for some people in your club, but for some smaller clubs and newer PEs, uh, we want to make sure you're aware of these. You've seen the picture, you have some awareness, and that's really about all I have to say about that. Um, it will be covered later, and there are people that uh, can give you help with any of these if your club is small and struggling or someone left the club with this information. Um, I believe there'll be people at the, in CNY Rotary, there'll be people available at the next uh, training assembly to answer questions. So that's all I have. Enjoy the rest of the presentation and enjoy your year when you become president. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Is, is Dave on? I have just got on. My apologies for being a little bit late to just uh, trying to get the computer booted up. Uh, Welcome everyone. Uh, tonight, I'd like to introduce our uh, our two speakers. Um, one will be the first will be Bruce Chapman. 
He belongs to the Victor Farmington Club in District 7120. He is our district's insurance representative. He's a Rotarian who's been, he started Rotary in, in the year 2000. So he's going on his, uh, into his 24th year. The second uh, presenter will be our district treasurer, Scott Healy, who is a member of our Newark, New York club. He has been a Rotarian since 1999. Uh, both are very uh, informative. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing their presentations. We have a uh, start or Dave? Okay. So yeah. I'm Bruce Chapman. As he mentioned, I'm a member of the Victor Farmington Club and I have been the kind of the insurance representative where people in our district, when they have um, events and they are required to have uh, insurance certificates, they contact me. I process the insurance certificate and get it out to where they need to have that, that taken care of. I'm assuming that the other districts have someone similar to me, but I've been asked to go over what, um, what the insurance covers. And I am going to do my best at sharing my screen. Bear with me here for a minute. Um, I put this on my desktop, but I'm relatively new at some of this, so. Or not new, still a lot of practice doing this. No pressure, Bruce. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, I'll just like uh, it's probably the most exciting thing in all of Rotary is to uh, is insurance. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, bear with me here for a second. Has someone given you the rights to share your screen? Yeah. I would need, yes, please. I do need the rights to share my screen. You have the option to share your screen. At the bottom of your screen, there's a green box with an arrow in it. That is your share screen button. There you go. Uh, do you want to share the PDF? You just have to click on that file. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, so this is directly off the website. Um, it looks like Rotary's actually changed the broker that they use, which really doesn't make a lot of difference. But I thought I'd just go over this a little bit uh, on kind of a high level. So uh, the, uh, the Rotary RI provides general liability, directors and officers, and employment practices liability. So a little bit about this. Um, this, is, this is actually right off their website. Um, it shows how to obtain a certificate of insurance. In our district, you can just contact me and I'll take care of it for you. Although you probably could go on the website and take care of it yourself. Um, uh, some, it says right here, how to obtain an additional insured endorsement. Sometimes the places where you meet will require uh, to be an, listed as an additional insured. If that's the case, just let me know. Typically, you'll get me the uh, whatever the requirements are. But the limits for insurance are um, 2 million per occurrence, meaning any one given claim would be up to 2 million. And then they show 2 million in non owned auto. I can talk about that in a minute. 2 million uh, sexual misconduct. And uh, there's actually a 5 million, it says excess insurance, that would be an umbrella. It says the first $250,000 is paid by, um, it's like a deductible. RI has a, a program that actually covers that. Um, the coverage territory is the US, it's possessions in Canada. Um, things are outside of the US. Um, again, you can contact myself and I can reach out and find out how we would need coverage for that. Um, what the coverage does is it covers um, the named insured, for all the Rotary clubs, Rotary districts, foundations, district foundations, Interact, Rotaract, Community Corps, uh, Youth Exchange, Youth Leadership, uh, President-elect training, zones. It's pretty much covers anything 
that's sponsored by Rotary itself. I'm going to you know, flip on here. This is important. Entities not covered. Provisional Rotary Club or fellowship organizations. Um, action groups. Inner Wheel. Gift or Life. Youth Act. Um, the big thing I want to point out here is camp operations, because I know our district has a camp and many of the others do. The, the insurance does not cover those camp operations, and you would need to uh, access insurance through a local broker. Uh, there, there are companies out there that do insure camps. Um, incident reporting. Again, if you have an incident, you can contact me. We've had like in the, all the years I've done it, I think we had one incident where um, there was a cartoon someone used and uh, some attorney out there was fishing and they found that and uh, they, they instituted a lawsuit, which we turned in and it was taken care of. So general liability does protect the club against liability for bodily injury and property damage that you do to someone else. Um, Personal and advertising injury would cover you for libel, slander, false arrest, false imprisonment. I don't really see too many claims there. Liquor legal, that's pretty important because a lot of clubs have alcohol as part of their fundraising. Um, the one thing that they say here is that if a liquor license is required, you must have the liquor license in place or liquor liability is not provided. Um, and it excludes injury, arising out of any alcoholic beverage while any required license is not in effect. I would say if you are having a, an, a party among yourselves, you don't need a liquor li license, um, and there was an incident, you'd have coverage for that. What liquor liability does, it's part of like the dram shop law. So any organization or any business that is part of the chain of providing alcohol is liable for whatever would occur. So for instance, um, someone drinks too much, they are involved in an accident and the person who's injured sues under liquor legal liability, everyone in that chain would be somewhat responsible. Another thing to remember too, is that the insurance pays for an attorney to defend you. So you don't need to get your own attorney. The insurance company will do that. Medical payments, this is like goodwill coverage. So the way that works is let's say that um, you have a guest at your club or even, well, let's say a guest. They don't tie their shoes, they fall and break their arm. Certainly no fault of your club or you. However, the insurance company would say, you know what, we're gonna go ahead and fix your broken arm. Here's a check, don't sue us. Non-owned rented auto liability. The big, the big exposure there is non-owned. So let's say you are driving your vehicle for a rotary business and you're involved in an accident and it's your fault. The person that you hit will initially go through your own auto insurance. So you are responsible for any damage that you do. But let's say they also say, well, hey, you know what? You are, uh, you're on business for rotary. And not only am I gonna go through your insurance, I'm gonna go through Rotary's insurance or your club. This provides coverage for your club. Um, sexual misconduct um, provides coverage for allegations of uh, abuse or molestation um, with, with youth. So I'm just looking here. There, there's good things on here. There's the youth protection guidelines, always good things to uh, prevent claims. Uh, let's see here. Construction projects. I don't know how many people or how many clubs actually do physical construction projects, but uh, they are, let's say value materials are 50,000 or more. Your club has to purchase a primary liability policy. So in other words, if you're acting kind of as a, you're doing a construction project, that you are sort of the GC on, um, you're gonna need to get your own coverage for that. Firework, there's limitations there. Um, when you provide, a, when you sign an agreement with a polytechnic firm, um, you must purchase primary general liability with a minimum of 5 million. In addition, your club may require the pyrotechnic firm to carry a limit of 5 million per occurrence. So 
if, if you are doing that, you definitely want to have that, that fireworks firm to provide you with a certificate of insurance and name you as an additional insured. Again, hey, question, yes. Uh, it's Ann um, LaRue. What is Andy, DC please hold quick, put your questions in chat. Please okay. hold your questions. Okay. Um, again, any of these things, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, let's see here. If you have an event that exceeds 25,000 people, that'd be a pretty good size event. Um, you would have to purchase general liability coverage for that event. Uh, there are policies out there for single event type things um, that, that you can purchase that are inexpensive. Uh, a lot of it depends on whether you serve alcohol or not. Uh, certain exclusions uh, are on policies, communicable diseases. These became This became really evident during the COVID. Elder care, no coverage for providing coverage for uh, elderly or meals on wheels, things along those lines. If your club provides some kind of child care, there's no coverage for child care. They're not going to provide coverage for aircraft. Um, crime, it does not cover theft of clubs funds. So theft is covered by crime insurance, which is like a fidelity bond. Your club really, they kind of need to determine whether it's something that is uh, important. And again, you can purchase that separately. And property. So any, if you have, um, let's say you meet at a special place, which we all do, and you have all kinds of contents and special property, the club, this policy does not cover property, only liability. And directors and officers. So directors and officers, it gives coverage for directors and officers for liability for the duties that they perform. So one of the things that I talk about would be failure to enforce bylaws, or let's say your club decided, well, we have some money and we want to invest this money to maximize it. And we're going to put it in Bitcoin. And I'm just using that as an example, but let's say you're, you're all, it just vanishes and the members sue the directors and officers. Uh, that's where that coverage would come into play. There's also employment practices liability. And you may think, well, we don't really have employees, but um, volunteers are covered there also. So let's say that you have an application for membership and it's denied and this person comes back and sues your club saying, will you deny me based on race, creed, color, sexual orientation, something along those lines. That's where an employment practices liability uh, policy would come into play. Um, insurance, let's see, there's assessments charged. I'm not 100% sure on how that all works. I'm only giving you the big kind of broad overview. Um, insured persons on the DNO and uh, EPLI, uh, directors and officers and employment practices, it includes past presidents, future directors, trustees, <laughs> board members, governors, managing members, um, uh, insured, any employee, volunteer. It's very, very broad coverage. And Again, for the directors and officers and employment practices liability, you can see who the insured entities are. And uh, you can also see here that the, these are not insured entities. And again, incident reporting, you can report to me or you can go directly online. That's really pretty much it. Here's some definitions on directors and officers. Um, it, they're, kind of interesting claims. I don't want to take a ton of time for people. Uh, if you have in, any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and I can provide this to you. Did you want to do the questions now that people write in or wait till the end, Ralph? Bruce, there was a question from Anne. What is GCM? GCM? Yes. Up, and where did she you, see that? Uh, up above, you had mentioned GCM before you got to the directors and officers. Yeah, you mentioned it a bit ago. General contract. 
manager. What, what does that mean? I don't understand that. I don't recall using the term GCM. Bruce, you, you referred to it during the construction piece. Oh, oh, okay. Um, general, um, uh, like a, a, a general, um, con if you're being a GC, a general contractor, that's what I meant. A GC is a general contractor. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, again, it doesn't sound like there's any, there's a lot there. Please, any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer those for you. There was a question um, about satellite clubs being covered and I believe that Rolf answered it in the chat. Um, that would this insurance cover the activities of a duly recognized satellite club? And we believe- A satellite club would have their own, um, they would be recognized by RI though, correct? Yeah, they're, a satellite Bruce is part of, uh, if it's a recognized satellite club, it's part of that club. So they're covered under the club's indemnity. I would agree with you, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're what? good, Bruce. Thank I, you. I hope much. I didn't bore you too much. <laughs> very, very informative, Bruce. I, actually, I, I learned some things. I do the, the policies for our club, and uh, it's a uh, it's it'll, it will help me again reach out if you ever have questions thank you everybody thank you and in the and in the chat there was a question about is does bruce is bruce handling uh cny and in, in the chat there is the representative who will be the insurance rep for cny coming up agreed yes and as he is uh don reese okay um with no further ado, Scott, are you uh, ready to start? Yes, thank you, Dave. I'm going to uh, try to share my screen as well and bring up. Uh... If I can get that uh, in the right place. Um, while I'm uh, working on that, um, just want to say thanks, Bruce. The one thing that uh, you you didn't get correct was the only thing more boring than the insurance is the the bookkeeping, accounting, budgeting part of it. So, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was reminded of that earlier on. So, just to start off, in case anybody else is somewhat like minded, um, Syracuse is playing North Carolina tonight in the Carrier Dome, and Syracuse is up twenty three fifteen. Okay. <laughs> So I'll try not to look at that regularly, but uh, uh, I may glance down occasionally. So um, my presentation tonight is, is primarily about budgeting and some financial aspects for uh, uh, club presidents to be aware of. And I think um, in many cases, um, presidents know that they have to rely on other people in their club, including their treasurer, to uh, help with some of these things. So. I uh, just want to walk through some of that. I've got uh, slides and I can make this available for anybody who would uh, like that later as well. Um, but to get started, this is the time of the year to, to work on your club budget. Um, I know it's the beginning of a lot of training and a, a lot of planning for your year as president, but uh, you really have to have things done and in place before your year starts. So it's really not too early to do that. Um, probably the first person you should touch base with is your club treasurer. Um, I think in many clubs, uh, treasurers and secretaries tend to be long-term officers who have a wealth of information and knowledge about what's going on and, and uh, what needs to be done. And presidents serve uh, once, maybe a couple times uh, throughout their tenure. So use the people who are in those positions to help you out. Uh, determine whether you need to establish a full, uh, some kind of a committee. It may just be treasurer and, and president-elect, uh, might be include some board members, 
whatever is appropriate in your club, but uh, get that process going. And then, um, you know, work on developing some sort of a, a worksheet. And that can be pretty simple or, or more complex, depending upon your club's finances. Um, I do have an example of that we can go to uh, a little later. So I'll save that uh, uh, for the end. There's nothing really magic about it, but whatever your club does, uh, how they report finances on some sort of a financial report is probably a good uh, place to start. When you're doing the budgeting, it's important to, you know, review what you've done in the past, the actual results from a prior year or the, you know, current period of this rotary year versus your budget to know if you're plus or minus ahead or behind. Um, it gives you information about what you might need to adjust in the future. Uh, review the, you know, all the categories of income and expense and make sure you consider what you expect to be different in the new year. I think oftentimes we focus on things like a, a new fundraiser or project and uh, you're thinking about that, but it doesn't make its way back to the club from a budgeting standpoint. We kind of figure we can wing it and raise the money and pay for something as we go. So try to give that some thought in advance. Um, you know, budget should be realistic, uh, not just what you hope for. It should be a plan and uh, it might not be the right number. It may change or actuals might be different, but try to be realistic in the, the planning process for what you're doing. Um, it's important to understand what your process is in your club uh, to approve the budget. There might be, you know, a formality of the board or a club vote or whatever that may be. So make sure you know what that process is and create a timeline so that you can meet the, the requirements that may uh, have to be followed. Uh, if you have to submit it to your board, you know, for review and approval, again, make sure there's time to do that before you have to present it to uh, maybe the full club. And, and probably most importantly, what's the real reason for this and why is it so crucial? And it's really because your budget determines what your dues will probably be for the year. Between your dues and, and any other fundraising activities, that's the revenue that comes in. And um, you need to modify dues periodically to adjust for those other overhead costs and, and the cost of running the club that aren't covered um, under fundraisers and things like that. Um, I know everybody has different philosophies on dues. Uh, we're all struggling with membership in some way or form and uh, everybody costs go up every year but one strategy i think that uh, makes sense is rarely should you hold the line unless there's kind of you know extenuating circumstances small increases on a regular basis just make it a lot easier and more palatable uh, than having to hold off for two or three years and then raise your club dues by 20 or 30 or 50 dollars or something so you know, give that a thought and how you go about the, the process. <clears throat> Going to a little bit more of general uh, financial information and policies, make sure you do understand some of your club's own financial policies. Um, who are authorized check signers? Is it just the treasurer? Um, do you require more than one signature on checks? Um, maybe only checks uh, for expenditures over a certain dollar amount. But make sure you're aware of that. Again, a lot of this comes under treasurer's uh, duties, but as club president, you want to make sure that you're aware of what those policies are. And if you need to be uh, a party to some of that, um, the, the awareness goes a long way. Uh, make sure you understand where your banking uh, relationships are. Do you have separate bank accounts for your operating uh, funds and uh, separate accounts for fundraising? Some clubs do, some clubs okay. don't. There isn't a uniform uh, answer to that. You might have a savings account or a CD if you have some excess uh, funds that you've accumulated. So just be aware of where those things are and who's authorized to act on those accounts. Um, and again, what, what kind of a payment process and approval do you have for you know paying bills and expenses? It's always a question of uh, you know practicality. Usually the treasurer has most of the authority to do that but occasionally uh, for a large expenditure or maybe something that wasn't budgeted in the, uh, the beginning of the year that came about throughout the year, you might want to, uh, you know, change the policy a little bit and have a different process. Um, 
the the whole budget process and determining dues leads you right into the dues billing and collection. Uh, it's important to understand how that happens, when it happens, who's responsible for uh, what pieces of it. Some clubs might bill uh, annually, some might bill semi-annually. Again, knowing what and when your club does the billing and what's expected from your club members, how long they have to pay, how much they have to pay, just important to know um, your dues are probably one of the most significant elements of your revenues. So if the money isn't coming in, you can't pay for any of the other uh, expenses. Um, the record keeping and storage of the records, it seems like a small thing, um, maybe becoming a little less of an issue, but um, a greater issue in another way. Um, years past, uh, somebody had a, a paper box or a banker's box full of records and that went from treasurer to treasurer and uh, somebody's closet and things like that. And today, more and more records are probably electronic and stored somewhere. But the same issue uh, really occurs. It's on somebody's laptop or in somebody's cloud storage. And if you need to have access to those records for future use, you want to you know, just be aware of where they are and make sure your club has some kind of a policy governing, uh, you know, at least identifying that. Um, Understanding what your financial reporting is to both, you know, your board of directors and to the club. Uh, how often, what level of detail you're going to provide. Um, I've been involved in lots of organizations from small to large. And I think sometimes small organizations like Rotary Clubs, um, people have a lot more interest in day to day and uh, some of the details. It tends to lead to more frequent reporting. And the larger organizations get, they rely more on a treasurer, a finance committee, maybe a small group of people to really oversee that function and, and have a less frequent reporting to the, the greater uh, group. So uh, again, understand what it is and make sure that you can follow your own club's rules and policies. Um, and you know, uh, another item is just what is the approval process for non-budgeted items? Seems like a small um, issue, but things come up all the time uh, that aren't planned for a year in advance. Um, you might have very worthwhile projects to do or other things and paying for it and, and understanding the process you're gonna follow when you do that is important so that you don't run afoul of rules or run into financial hardship that you didn't really anticipate. So. Just be aware of uh, what those kinds of processes would be. Generally, a best practice that, that's recommended is annually to have, um, and I use the, the word audit in quotes because uh, as a CPA, it has a very specific meaning and uh, requirements, but as kind of a general term, it just means somebody else is kind of looking at records to see that things are being handled the way that they would expect and that their, their records are retained and maintained in a manner that they can be reviewed by someone uh, when and if needed. Um, many clubs do this. Uh, sometimes it's just a small group of uh, uh, person or, or people who have some other financial training, uh, maybe a past club treasurer or something like that that will work with the treasurer, review some of the records and, and just kind of issue some sort of a, a little bit of a report that everything seemed in order and bank accounts are correct and reconciled and, and things like that. <clears throat> um, I think that kind of reaches the end. I'm gonna kind of jump back a, a quick second. Um, PDG Evan was talking a little bit about uh, taxes and, and dues and things. And in the past, I've kind of covered a little bit of that, but just one um, important element I wanted to talk about with taxes and, uh, and some of the finances is, is many clubs have created their own club uh, foundation in addition to the Rotary Club. And it's important to remember that that foundation is a separate legal entity that it requires separate legal governance. It should have a board. It should keep its own records. And that entity also would have to, you know, comply with any tax filing requirements. So it is important to, uh, to be aware of that. And um, it might be completely run by a different group than, uh, than what you're becoming president of in your club. 
but in most instances, the a club uh, foundation works hand in hand with their club and the club board to uh, determine how they're going to spend their money and um, what kind of fundraisers they're going to do. So be aware of that. Um, there are also tools, um, not the easiest for, uh, for everyone to find, but there are tools for you to look up and determine whether you are still in good standing or if your club hasn't filed for uh, three or more years, the Internal Revenue Service can revoke your tax exempt status. And uh, there are steps you can take to, to get back into good graces, so to speak. But um, there is a way that you can check on that. So if it's something that uh, anyone's interested in where you're not sure of the kind of situation you're in, um, I'd be happy to, to try to help out. I just uh, was doing that for a, a, a new client that I took on. Um, it was a small charitable organization and uh, they knew they hadn't filed. And sure enough, they their tax exempt status was revoked in 2018, I believe. So it wasn't real recent, but uh, we're going to try to get them set straight and on the path to uh, uh, doing things uh, a little bit differently and a little bit better going forward. So, so that's it for for what I have. Uh, be happy to take questions. We do have a couple of questions in the chat, Scott. Um, Charlie asks, we have three different accounts, operations, philanthropy savings, and donations for special fundraisers to support activities for projects. Do we need to have a budget for each account? I think generally the answer is your budget would be kind of really the overall at the club level. But yeah, you would probably build that overall budget by knowing what you're going to do in each of those specific areas. Um, it's not so much about budgeting for the bank account, but each account represents a different kind of function or operation within the club that probably would have uh, input uh, as to how, uh, how you're gonna raise money, raise uh, revenue and what kind of expenses you're gonna have, so. Uh, Sam wanted to know, will the budget worksheet example be provided to us? Uh, yeah, we can make that available. In fact, uh, I can probably try to uh, bring that one up uh, while we're doing this. That's this one here. And just so you're done with your um, PowerPoint, right? I can take that down. Yes, yeah. Oh, that's... you're sharing the, the copy. Yes. Okay. I don't want to take the example down if you're sharing the example. <laughs> yeah, so this, uh, what's up here now is this budget worksheet. This is actually a document that is available on the RI website. Um, again, I just checked for it the other day, and it hadn't changed from what they've had and posted in the past. It's probably buried a little, a few layers deep somewhere, so... Um, I can share this with uh, Denise and we can get it out to the group. Uh, but if you kind of look, I know it's a, a bit small and it's broken up in categories the way uh, this was presented, but <clears throat> down the, the, the rows down the side are basically income from different types of things, operations and charitable <clears throat> expenses, again, are kind of broken up into areas for operations um, in this case, they have like secretaries type expenses. Um, there's a line for district dues. We talked about that. You've got district dues. You've got Rotary International dues, uh, meeting expenses, uh, things you have to cover uh, out of that, uh, conferences, assemblies, committees, <clears throat> just kind of runs through a, a wide variety of examples of things you could have in a budget and kind of comes down from a revenue and expense standpoint. And then across the top, what it, it really does is show the prior year budget, the prior year actual, whether you were under or over. So if you kind of spread that out that way and then do an estimate of what your current year is, it gives you a good idea of are we you know, growing, shrinking? Um, do we need to increase something or decrease something? And when you look at it in more detail like this, it makes much more sense than maybe sitting around a, in a board meeting 
speculating about what's going to be new or different. Uh, sometimes a, an actual expense line will will jog your memory about an item or an issue, and uh, it, it leads to a much more accurate budget process. So it's just a, an example of a worksheet. Um, and again, if your club's finances uh, and and financial reports are laid out in a slightly different format, uh, use the same idea, but follow your format and and just realize that you can do things like this and plug in uh, comparisons to uh, you know prior and uh, future. And thank you to Alicia who put the spreadsheet in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to have that yeah. link to it, and also we will be sharing everything that is presented and the recording from tonight on the uh, M M the Empire MD Pets website. Uh, that link is also in the chat. Um, and everything from last week's session is also on that website as well. Um, somebody asked, where can we find the tools to check the good standing of the club? Um, it's on, there's an IRS site. It's, um, I mentioned it's not real easy. It's something I have to have bookmarked to remember myself. Um, but if you go to irs.gov and, uh, search for tax exempt entities, you'll probably come up with, um, one of the, the buttons to hit and it asks you to search for the entity and you can search by, name, location, tax ID number. There's a, a number of different parameters. And sometimes you have to try to narrow it down uh, using more than one to identify it. But um, as I, I did one the other day and I didn't know uh, specifics about this entity. So I was using a, a ver variation on their name, but because I knew the location, I was able to, uh, to find that one. And it will tell you, uh, you know, when your uh, status was revoked, if it was, and if you've filed recently, um, a separate lookup, you can usually actually look up and obtain a copy of the report or tax return that was filed. So that can be really helpful if uh, you have new people coming into, you know, uh, a position and maybe you don't have those records in the past too. So and good on Lizzie. She got that search page right up from the IRS and put that in the chat. So if anybody was looking for that page on the IRS website, uh, that's listed in the chat for you as well. Um, and a really good reminder from Jim Amell, uh, who I leaned on a lot when I was district governor, if your club doesn't have a foundation, make sure the fundraising portion of your club income isn't supporting operating or overhead expenses. Said differently, dues and other operating income should cover operating expenses. Fundraising income should be used for charity or community service. You shouldn't be operating your club on money that you're taking in as fundraising. Those are the questions from the chat that pertain to your section. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome, thank you everybody. Oh, there was a question about rotary dues and Rolf has put in the answer that uh, for 24-25, the rotary dues are a total of 97.50 per person, the RI rotary dues. All right, are there any last questions from the group before we wrap up for this evening? All right, excellent. Can we take down the share so we can see each other? Thank you so much. Thank you, Evan and Bruce and Scott. This information is, uh, as you mentioned a couple of times, not the most exciting stuff, but it's so important. And you did a great job of really highlighting for our, our incoming club leaders exactly what needs to be on their radar. Maybe they don't have to be in charge of it all. Uh, hopefully they have a good team supporting them, uh, but they definitely need to be aware of all of these things. So I just have a few wrap up announcements for us this evening. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna do is put a link in the chat for you, another one. Uh, and this one is to a simple form where we're asking for your feedback in advance of our in-person pet session next month. We have a panel discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as a breakout session on mental health. 
and the facilitators for both of those have asked for your feedback and thoughts in advance. So if you have questions on those topics that you're hoping they'll be able to address, we wanna hear from you now. So you can use the link in the chat um, to submit your feedback for us. And we'll share that each week uh, leading up to our, our big pets. We still um, have that event open for registration. Your time is starting to run out though. So please don't wait. If you're gonna come to Syracuse March 15th through the 17th, we are at a new location this year, a different one. Uh, not new, it's actually pretty old. Uh, we were there many years ago, but it's completely revamped and it's really, really nice. And that's the Double Tree on Carrier Circle in Syracuse. And you can go to rotaryempiremdpets.org to register to attend. Your club has already paid for you to be there. You do need to register though, to let us know you're coming. And if you need a place to stay while you're there, cause you're not local and can't commute, we, we arrange for a nice low rate on the hotel. It's 140 a night, but that runs out next Tuesday. Sorry, next Monday, February 19th. So yeah. don't sleep on that because- and, and We extended that for another week. So- Yes. So please take advantage of it. Doesn't mean you can't get a room after, but you might pay more. And we certainly don't want that to happen. Our next virtual session is going to be Wednesday, February 21st at 7 p.m. in this exact same Zoom room, same link. And we'll be talking about public image, how to represent Rotary's brand beautifully. So be sure to invite anyone from your club who would benefit from knowing about logos and images and graphics, your newsletter editor, a social media person, your public image chair. It's a Zoom session, so the more the merrier. And I do want to also take a moment, as we will do each week, to thank our sponsors for this year's pets training, Haran Insurance and Best Travel Partners, both Rotarian-run businesses. Haran Insurance is located in Baldwinsville, but they can serve you wherever you're at in the Empire District. Their office is friendly, responsive, and they care. And because they're brokers, they can shop around to get you a great deal on your home or business insurance. You can visit them online at haraninsured.com and uh, hopefully there'll be someone there you can meet in person at our in-person weekend. We also want to thank Best Travel Partners. They will spoil you with the highest quality, most personalized travel, ser travel service available. Visit besttravelpartners.com to start planning your next trip and speak with Rotarian and Amir's at Pets when you see her there. Finally, I, I put the link in the chat way early on. So if you got here right at seven, you might've missed it, but you can follow Rotary, or sorry, Empire Multi-District Pets on Facebook. And we share a lot of helpful tips and reminders. That's also where we'll let you know when all of these resources and the recording are available on the website later this week. So we will hopefully see you next Wednesday at our next session. Thank you everyone.